just welcome everyone okay sure. uh, so uh, very good evening everyone uh, uh, you know thank you for joining for a uh, you know a uh, session on uh, how digital health is transforming uh, mental health and psychiatry uh, aspects today we have eminent speaker dr avinash and moderator dr anukant uh, mittal uh, from iapp uh thank you iapp for this opportunity to you know uh, to discuss one of the serious aspect of the uh, medical uh, uh, thing right now about mental health and what all the latest advancements in terms of technology tools and other uh, aspects revolving around uh, mental health uh, and psychiatry over to you doctor right avinash yes uh so i'll just share my screen right okay uh good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this talk on how digital health is transforming the orient interaction in mental health and wellness uh, the whole aim of my lecture today is uh, to give you a bird's eye view of the advantages the the uh, sort of progress digital health has made in the area of mental health and wellness uh, there are a number of sub topics that i would be covering uh, each of these sub topics could basically be a one hour one and a half hour session on their own so we may not really be able to do a lot of details of each sub topic but there are a lot of themes and um, um, i think um, areas that i would sort of be covering and i feel it's important because uh this would give you an idea of how we are digitally getting attuned to to digital health from say a mental health perspective we all know that there's a huge emergence of mobile technologies in healthcare now we have seen that happen during the pandemic we've seen it happen during this entire period and uh, mobile technologies in healthcare are primarily useful in multiple areas so one is in prevention so a lot of education mental health awareness programs can be done Uh, through mobile uh, healthcare a diagnosis of patients is done through it we have decision making where in real time clinical decision making uh, you send off the reports you get an answer you start medication uh, a lot of treatments of course are done online and there's a huge amount of follow up of a patient that is from a remote location following up with an urban doctor which is being done through mobile technologies and when we look at mobile interventions the whole aim is that we have an improved accessibility for better patient care there's no doubt many areas may not have a uh, specialty doctors many areas may not have specialized mental health professionals so we overcome the limited clinical resources which are there most importantly we deliver evidence based treatment everywhere it is free it is portable the person carries his mobile phone anywhere it can be used in a broad range of settings right from his house to a hospital to a non hospital setting and basically in current times as well as i think in the times ahead the person will overcome the logistical difficulties which are associated with uh, scheduling and traveling particularly to receive mental health which won't which won't be a problem anymore and there's a huge cost saving because you train staff all over india to de deliver these programs and it may not really work so you can have people who are trained deliver uh, these programs when it is needed across many therapeutic uh, centers and i think uh, there wouldn't sort of be a, a worry at all now what up no no yeah so when you look at mobile intervention technologies one is that there is a huge versatility in computerized and mobile technologies because it frees up clinician time so for example uh, you can have an intake form which you know the patient can fill in when the patient is waiting for treatment it extends the reach of the therapist between sessions uh, you can have a treatment extended component at times booster sessions may be there uh, at risk access to the clinician is there whenever you are there and most importantly uh, skilled uh, you can also access and practice the skills learned in treatment in mobile technology basically independent of the clinician so if the you 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 have been taught certain mood engaging yeah. techniques certain mindfulness based techniques you have videos which you can see on a mobile platform and probably follow that in a day to day practice uh, in your um, life itself now when we look at mental health apps what's very important to understand is that average users 
check their phones as often as 150 times a day, which reflects how smartphone apps can generate, reward, maintain a lot of the strong habits we have. The demand for these apps, mental health apps are very strong. And uh, a lot of surveys done, public health surveys have shown that around 76% of patients felt that uh, they would be interested in using a mobile phone for self-management and self-monitoring of the mental health, particularly if the service was free. So this is something which uh, is very important to look at. And when you look at mental health apps, they have a huge amount of benefit. One is they, they provide psychoeducation. So that's one big thing. So you have you can have articles on various facets of a psychiatric problem and a patient could go through that and gain knowledge from that. They also provide uh, the enhanced provider patient communication. So it could there could be a chat option available where he could communicate with the doctor and the doctor or the doctor's assistant or the psychologist could respond. Uh, Self-monitoring, he could monitor his mood, he could monitor his sleep, he could monitor multiple things. It also reduces stigma because it uh, creates awareness about the disorder. Uh, it also gives you some supportive therapy because you can have uh, uh, some kind of supportive help. Okay, what do you do if I'm feeling low? What do I do if I'm not able to sleep? What do I do if I'm angry? So some supportive therapy can be there and it empowers the patient. That's a very important aspect. When we look at more mental health apps on mobiles, it's convenient, it's anonymous, it's very low cost. It provides service to more people. It's 24 hours and it provides consistency. Of course, we have to also look at the effectiveness. Apps have to be built <clears throat> by professionals uh, who know that these apps are going to be effective. Uh, will all the apps work for all people and all mental health conditions? We don't know. We need to have condition-specific apps. We need to have apps for schizophrenia. We need to have separate apps for uh, probably depression. We need to have separate apps for, for various uh, other things. So, so this is how... Uh, things would be. Privacy is an issue because we know about hacking and we know how patient data can be lost. There is also no good industry standard for these apps, so we need to work on that. Regulation and law to govern these apps isn't there. Some self-diagnosis may happen, sadly, which shouldn't ideally happen, but it can happen. And there may be an overselling of uh, these apps. Now, there are certain apps for depression and anxiety. I mean, I just want to make it very clear. I'm not related to these apps. Neither am I using these. I mean, neither am I sort of promoting these apps. These are just some of the apps which are available. So you have uh, What's My M3, which is a screening app for depression and anxiety. You have a self-monitoring app like a mood kit or a mood tracker that can track your mood across the day, every hour, every three hours. You get a mood graph at the end of a month or a week. And you also have a online CBT and online acceptance commitment therapy apps, which are available, which the patient can use. Now, when we use uh, mobile apps in depression and anxiety, there are some unmet needs. For example, the apps are not able to assess the therapeutic outcomes with pharmacological agents, which are very often the mainstay therapy in the management of anxiety and depression. And also, we do not have apps to assess therapeutic adherence and medication compliance. And this is difficult because we don't know if the patient is probably just clicking away and saying he took his meds when he's actually not taken it. We don't have any way by which we can determine whether the meds are actually in the patient's body or not. We also now move to another concept, which is a very interesting concept in mental health, and particularly with so much of digital overload that we've had in this pandemic, which is something that we refer to as digital amnesia. So basically, we have what we call digital symbiotic living. We're living together in a digital world wherein a lot of the things we do are digital. Everything we do is digital. Everything is Google-based, which we refer to as a Google effect. And around 80% of us rely on our digital devices more than we did five years ago. I think today it's around 95% of us that rely on our digital devices. So along with our behavior, our brain is also adapting to these devices. So technology has changed the way we think, learn, behave, evolve. And the digital devices are very convenient. We don't need a diary. We don't need a cal calendar. We don't need a planner. It holds all the information that we remember. So there's an over-reliance on these connected devices and the internet, which both contribute towards the patient, the doctor, the mental health professional, his patients, both developing what we refer to as a digital amnesia. So is digital amnesia a real problem? or it's just another fancy jargon. A lot of people feel, no, there's nothing like digital amnesia, but is it actually a problem? So how does it happen? What happens is you have digital devices which are relied upon. These devices are relied upon to encode 
to store to retrieve information and uh, these extend to you know they have extensions of memory with additional storage capacities so what they do is they free the people of the burden of needing to remember so what happens is people do not exercise the memory centers of their brain now this is a side effect of digital health which is very important and what happens is when you are dependent on devices to store memory neuronal activity depletes in your brain because there's no information to rehearse so it's very important that we do not lose that there's no long term memory formation there's no recall means as the memory remains weak and what is not needed to be remembered you forget so if you ask the patient he needs to depend on his phone so this is one slight negative aspect of digital health that we need to be very particularly you know you know aware about so a lot of devices are being used as digital brains in fact 34% of europeans say that the smartphone is their memory 79% of people say how digital devices help them access information only 20% say they rely on their memory alone and 64% use a connected device to remember any information that they need so it's not just a millennial phenomenon i think it's there across all age groups older people older age groups are also found to be equally and more dependent we now move on to the the future so in the future we're going to have digital health trackers which are there on our phones but what's very interesting to notice in the future we may not have a phone our phone might actually be something like this on our hand that we actually use you know we may not really carry a phone it might be just there on our hand and we can probably switch it on and off and the phone may be just in the band that we are wearing around the hand and we can you know probably switch it on and off and we'll get a screen on our hand which can help us access people similarly we'll come into the era where we'll probably have a transparent phone like this so it's going to be very transparent we already have phones which are foldable we'll probably have smaller and smaller phones which we can carry with us so all sorts of things will happen uh, on the phone which is just like basically a small visiting card or like a piece of paper so we are going to have foldable phones and we're going to have foldable wristbands so imagine you'll have a mood tracker with you which is going to track your mood throughout the day track your physical activity throughout the day track multiple things it's like a wristband which is also a mobile phone it also functions as a mobile phone it also functions as a computer it also functions as everything it's going to be there around your hand and you're going to probably carry this with you throughout one of the things which digital health is going to bring to us is the use of these devices what we refer to as oculus devices so i have always said that probably in the long run we will have a patient who may have what we refer to as an enhanced online consultation the patient might probably sit in his home on a chair uh, you your clinic would provide him with an oculus device that lets him get into your consulting room he feels he's sitting in your consulting room talking to you when he's actually not there he actually gets the feel of your consulting room if he's a previous patient who's been with you in an offline consultation he can actually feel he's sitting in your room talking to you when he's actually in his chair he can see you sitting in front of him you're conversing with him you're answering his questions in real time it's just like an actual consultation happening but an, but a consultation happening virtually so you may have clinics that you know run these oculus devices particularly for online therapy sessions particularly for online consultations you might have the these oculus devices also for you know talking to the doctor in general so that the patient gets the real feel of being in a clinic unlike an online consult on a video call which is done probably from his room or bedroom he can actually feel he's sitting in the clinic he's sitting in any particular corporate hospital talking to his doctor discussing about his health he's transported virtually to the doctor's clinic which is something which probably wasn't there some years back but it's it's probably now come in now we're also going to have revolutions when it comes to explaining about mental health to patients what you see here is a surface anatomy scanner that is going to explain anatomy to people we now we're also going to have something like this for the brain which is actually going to teach the patient this is your brain this is your frontal lobe this is your hippocampus this is your amygdala and it's going to actually show him areas which are hot and cold in his brain and the neurobiological circuits involved in his brain so while we are empowering the patient we are also going to educate him and explain to him circuitry wise what's wrong in his brain in depression what's wrong in schizophrenia what's wrong in anxiety and what's probably going to happen in the long run well i think 
on the lighter side, we're also going to probably have payments in the form of cryptocurrency rather than probably have payments in real time currency. So we'll all shift to digital currency in the long run. And well, this is something which is very important. Patients may be able to choose what they want to wear for a consultation in an online medium. Patients may probably choose how they want to look. So these are some avatar makers that, you know, probably will come in. Uh, I know I'm a little far fetched ahead of my time, but these are things which probably will come in in the long run. Just like you choose your groceries, just like you choose your vegetables, just like you choose your fruits, you're probably going to be able to choose your mental health expert based on his area. It's already there on so many apps. So you're going to have a person sitting in a tier two city in Mumbai, in, in India, is going to be able to look at the profiles of 50 doctors all over Bombay and choose which doctor he wants to consult based on that doctor's areas of interest, expertise, patient reviews, multiple things, which is something that was never, never available a little, probably five years ago, but it's something which has come in now. Well, you may also have special devices like this for online consultation where the patient would be sitting. He gets a feel of being in an online consultation chair. So this is just to tell you that these are things that can happen. Uh, in real time, you can also have a patient who's probably using simulated video games as therapy. So digital mental health talks about video games being used um, uh, for uh, the treatment of ADHD, neurofeedback being used. So you may have devices like this, which are used in a clinic to improve attention, focus and concentration, which earlier was never used. Uh, well, on the lighter side, a lot of things will happen online. So there would be, you know, couples that come for couples counseling online, marriages online. This is just again on the lighter side. Everything about mental health may become a QR code. The doctor may become a QR code. So you just have to click on this and all the information you want about a doctor is there. The entire patient history may be a QR code. So you just click on this, tell him this is your QR code, send it to any doctor who wants to know about you. And all his data would be there right from his first consultation with any other doctor to his last consultation with you. So everything would become stored on cloud. So that's how we're going to probably progress with time. We're also entering the era of robotics where we're having chatbots where you know you're going to chat with virtual psychologists who are you know nothing but robotic assistants that are trained to be psychologists and they're going to chat with you online just like you chat on a chatbot with say swiggy or zomato similarly we have mental health chatbots that are going to guide you initially and then tell you okay now is the time that you need to probably see a consultant and our consultant is waiting here online now to talk to you till then your basic symptoms your basic evaluation what you be in your history, multiple things may be taken in by a chatbot. So that's something which will also come in. Well, this is something which I just have put in here because they are probably saying that in the long run, we're going to have devices like this, which uh, probably could, you know, even track your movements if you're in other countries. So there are devices like this, wherein your entire physical activity may be tracked by your doctor, irrespective of which nation you're in. Your entire brain might be stored, you know, in the form of a digital imprint. So that's what the future is going to probably hold to us for mental health. I now move on to a new era, a new uh, gamut of, you know, digital health and artificial intelligence, which I refer to as psycho neuro robotics. And what is psycho neuro robotics? It's a term coined to describe an emerging field where robotics are used for the diagnosis, treatment, management of patients with psychological, psychiatric, and of course, neurological, neuropsychiatric, and neuro. So it's all psychological, psychiatric, neurological, neuropsychiatric, and neurodevelopmental disorders. This is still in a nascent stage, but it's going to come up in a very big way in the next two decades. So we're going to have robots which are going to decide, you know, about mental health. Probably they are trained, they're more versatile, they're non-emotional, they're not affected by anything what a person says. So we're going to have this whole, the entire brain is, you know, going to be looked at in the form of what we refer to as a connectomic approach that which also uses artificial intelligence. So that again is one of the advances which are probably coming up. We already know of robotic surgery, which is being done in so many fields of medicine. We're probably <clears throat> going to have robotic mental health intervention. So you're going to have 
people who robots who talk to you you're going to have robots who speak to you about various mental health issues you have robots who are trained only for depression you have robots who are trained only for schizophrenia you have robots who are trained only for anxiety so you will be assigned a robot who's going to probably be with you 24 hours you can even take the robo home and he's going to monitor you 8 o'clock he's going to come to you with your medicine and tell you it's time for you to take your medicine you better take it how are you feeling did you sleep well did you not sleep well what's happened don't worry you want a glass of water i'll get it for you he'll open your fridge go get the water get your tablets give it to you your strip is expired you need to buy a new strip from the chemist he'll phone the chemist himself arrange the strip from you i know i may sound a little manic in all that i'm saying but this is what the future is probably going to be so your doctor will of course interact with the robo and let me tell you there are also books written about the fact what if patients fall in love with their robos what if patients get involved with their robos so these are things you know which will probably come in in the long run but robotics is playing a big role in neurodevelopmental disorders here you see a robo which is developed uh, in america and japan which works with children that have autistic spectrum disorders and it plays a very good role in enhancing eye to eye contact in enhancing emotional expression in enhancing reduction of stereotypes and also at the same time in enhancing social communication in children with autism spectrum disorders and i think one of the beauty the beauty of the robo is the child with autism spectrum disorders doesn't feel judged he doesn't feel threatened he doesn't feel worried so that's what allows him to probably communicate better you have children with other neurodevelopmental disorders like intellectual impairment cerebral palsy that also benefit from the interaction with these robots and this is going to go a long way in in enhancing their care so if you see a child with autism he's very happy to sit with two robots rather than to sit with two children because he feels that these robots know him they understand him they talk to him the tone of voice of the robo changes with the tone of voice of the child so you'll never have somebody who'll shout or scream or you know the the robo knows you know what not to do unlike you know which another child may not probably know so this is one major advantage another area where robotics is playing a role is in the management of geriatric care and you have something called gero technology which is the, the use of <coughs> technology in geriatric care and you have these robots that are being used for patients who are elderly they may not be having dementia but they're living alone so as you can see here you have a robo here the person is having his breakfast there is a phone sign on the robo he can phone his son he can phone his relative uh, it tells him that it's time for him to take his pill so th this robo is sort of assisting the living of an elderly individual who's alone and in in japan they've developed this seal which is a robo and many patients with dementia have been very friendly with this seal so they talk to this seal they smile with this seal the seal goes and cuddles them a bit gives them a kiss sometimes on the morning and you know it makes them feel touched it makes them that crave for touch which dementia patients have you know gets fulfilled with with this kind of technology here again is an example of how robotics is used in japan with patients who have dementia and they enjoy playing with these seals they enjoy talking to these seals they enjoy talking to these robots and you know you have a male voice robot you have a female voice robot so depending on you know what the patient wants now one of the biggest advantages of this is they even sometimes take around 50 or 60 or 80 sentences recorded in the voice of the caregiver so the son of the patient may you know record the the wife of the patient may record the husband of the patient may record and the robo plays that voice so the patient also connects with that voice so this kind of an approach is also something <coughs> which is being used in india also many schools are promoting robotics so we're definitely going to see robotics come up in a very big way we have an indian who has developed these robots which are used for autism spectrum disorders i fail to remember his name and the name of the robots currently but there are two robots which are developed by him and he's basically from iit and he's developed these robots that work with and they are patented robots that work with autism spectrum disorders there is another robot developed again in india for work with autism spectrum disorders that is being used one of the again one of the other digital therapies which is you know used a lot is in the in the management of hallucinations something referred to as avatar therapy and this was something which dr leff julian leff from australia has you know used a lot and primarily it helps patients get rid of their hallucinations because a person that they are seeing in their hallucinations is recreated and they sort of confront this person and the person virtually then submits and you know goes away so it plays a big role it's it's again one of the newer therapies the entire apparatus is available so it's something which is revolutionary and has been used 
And of course, robo robots have a huge role to play. They process faster. They have smaller power sources, so they don't consume a lot of power. You won't get a huge electricity bill. There's good voice recognition. There's good visual recognition. Their memory is very good. So they're therefore cheap and effective. So soon we will, of course, have robots that are identical to human relatives around us, which will also come. So if you have a son who's studying abroad, probably you'll have a robot which is like your son. So you won't miss your son. So, you know, these kind of things are probably which are going to come up in the long run. So our brain is getting more digital. Neurons are being digitalized. Multiple things are changing uh, with time. I'm also going to introduce you to one of the apps where I was associated a little in its development. I'm more of an advisor there. This has been developed by a group of researchers and it's an app called Monkey, where it is, you know, your monkey mind. It's Mun is the mind and Monkey, wherein this is an app which uses digital phenotyping. So your it's on your mobile phone. It uses your light sensor, your camera, your microphone, the temperature sensor of the phone, the humidity sensor of the phone, the accelerometer of the hand, multiple things, the touch screen, the fingerprint, the GPS, and it processes data. And it talks about physical data. It talks about your mood. It talks about uh, multiple other uh, processes which are involved in, in this whole thing. It also tracks your sleep. So what the app does is you, you, you come to know about your mood on a day-to-day -day basis on this app. This is just to show you how digital phenotyping is going to revolutionize uh, mental health probably in the long run. So it also, you can click on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you feeling loving? Are you feeling excited, joyful, proud, happy, whatever. So your mood is recorded on a day-to-day -day basis. You also select the reasons for your uh, issues. So it could be family, it could be work, it could be school, it could be multiple factors, it could be your bed and sleep. So multi bad sleep, good sleep, multiple things. So you select and it, it stores all this information. It gives you a good idea as to why a person's mood is low. And of course, you, you come to know, you know, for the day, how much of physical activity you did, how much of socializing you did, how much of device usage you did, how many hours of sleep you had, and your mood in the last 14 days comes as a graph like this. So whether your mood has been very positive, <clears throat> it has been slightly positive, it has been neutral, it has been, so you get an entire graph and your sleep duration graph over the last 14 days is also something which you probably get here yeah? and your overall mental well-being score. So, you know, on a score of zero to hundred, how you've been in the last uh, uh, 14 days. And this is just to show you that based on the well-being score. So suppose you're a clinician and you have around 50 or 80 patients are using this app, the scores, which are towards the lower end on the right side, that is red and orange are the patients that need your attention more. The scores are lower. So you click on those numbers and you get your patient's data in front of you and you come to know which of your patients haven't been doing well versus the greener ones, which are patients who have been relatively doing well. So you have a list of patients. You just click on one number, you get the name. So you come to know who the patient is and you can probably get an idea that, okay, the, the right hand lower column is what I need to monitor. Their wellness indexes aren't proper. I need to look at them. So this is one way at which also the patient gets an idea about, you know, his, his own graph. So he comes to know whether, you know, what are the factors that he has looked at the larger the world, that means he's, you know, performed better there. So work has been good. If you can see sleep, bad sleep has been quite high year. Family has been good. So there've been multiple factors and, you know, he, his mood, He's feeling tired. If you can see tired is the boldest. So he's feeling tired, anxious, depressed, numb, insecure is slightly smaller, angry is less, ashamed is the least. So this is one graph the patient gets to know about his mood. And this is something which is probably going to come. And you also get behavioral markers like your sleep, your mood. So this is what the app does. Also, we're now, we're also seeing a huge shift when it comes to telepsychiatry. And we know that there's a whole challenge of telepsychiatry in India and this whole need to switch to an online mode for mental health. This is very important to India because we're able to reach the unreached. The unreached are being reached. This is something which was never possible earlier, but this is something which is more and more possible now. And India has a huge population and we need to reach out to every state. The only way we're going to do that is through online mental health. What has happened now is digital health is accepted. Telepsychiatry is accepted. We have now accepted that we're going to consult our doctors online. This was something that wasn't there five years ago. Telepsychiatry has always been there. Online psychiatry has always been there, but it's only in the last pandemic, this entire last two years, that it has been accepted more and more as a means of treatment, something which has never happened before.
We're able to prescribe drugs online. We're able to monitor drugs online. We're able to get lab reports online. We're able to see MRIs online, things which were never there before. And you can prescribe, uh, you know, without without any worry. Though, of course, there are a few target populations where the old, where digital health may cause a worry, and particularly the older group. You know, they may not be very savvy technology-wise, so digital health may be a source of worry in such patients. But nevertheless, it's something that can be worked upon. Children are going to benefit. They're going to talk to their psychologists online. They're going to talk to their counselor online. So definitely children will benefit from this whole approach. Yes, the whole issue of fees, online money transfers, multiple things are going to change. There's no doubt on that. Psychiatric emergencies are going to be managed online. So we're going to change. There's going to be a paradigm shift in digital mental health. So we, of course, will have to look at the challenge of COVID-19, the lack of training in digital health. There are ethical concerns. Which platform is the best? Whether we would be allowed to advertise digital platforms and whether that would be regarded as an advertisement by the doctor. That's something which will have to be you know, looked at. The effectiveness of these measures, whether nurses and family physicians can be incorporated into this digital mental health program is what's something which we also have to look at. So this is an article I had written, it's come in the Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine, which you all can go through if you want it. I can send it to you all. Uh, before we end, we have to realize that digital mental health is here to stay. It's not going away anywhere. It's the future. It's going to be more and more there in the next decade or so. So we have to be ready for it and take it up as a challenge and see that we make the best of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Avinash. Uh, I think uh, this is as comprehensive and as concise a presentation on digital mental health or the future of mental health uh, can be covered in this much time. Uh, very elaborate, very concise, very point to the point, uh, very clear uh, uh, update on the state of affairs and what is possible in the future. A few things I think uh, which are currently there, which we are hopeful will develop further are uh, brain stimulation technique. Uh, we do have uh, brain implants now for patients with OCDs and depression who have electrodes implanted deep inside their brains, uh, which are remotely controlled by them exteriorly. So if they really feel that their mood is going down or they're feeling very possessed by a uh, thing, they can press a uh, button and uh, it kind of gives them a small jolt and perks up their mood. So something like that probably will get automated. And as Avinash has presented, if your uh, wristband perceives that your moods are slowing down or your brain activity is slowing down or your parameters are getting to a stage where you're depressed or you're getting over anxious, it can probably take preventive measures to sure that you don't you know, lapse into a mental illness. Uh, same thing like physical illness. If it feels that your respiration or your pulse rate is going up too much, it can probably, you know, give you a warning and stop you. And more so, the use of the digital devices is in the last five days. I don't know if you have heard. Uh, we've had three young doctors uh, between the age of 30 and 40, very healthy doctors, die sudden deaths. In fact, one is a video which is circulating on the WhatsApp of a person who's sitting outside on the steps of a gym while doing gym training. And he's hardly 40 years old. And on the CCTV, you can see him just touch his chest and he just falls down the steps and he's dead because he's collapsed because of a massive MI. Uh, so possibly if he would have been wearing a, a device which would tell him that he is, you know, in, in, in danger, he probably could have sought help and got help, uh, which would become more or less what is happening now. People are wearing their uh, you know, Fitbits and their you know, smartwatches, which are giving them reminders and all that. Of course, the major part is the use of robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, and the main thing that we are scared of is that at what stage will it come? Uh, like when I used to work in England, uh, I, I went back after some years and I went to visit my, uh, my colleague and I found that patients were being admitted under them 
they were never seen by the psychiatrists. Patients were coming in, they were being admitted by community nurses, they were seen by psychologists and community nurses, they were being evaluated and treated by health workers, and they were being discharged. And that was all under the name of the consultant psychiatrist who never, interact, never interacted with the patient. Uh, those kind of situations are worrisome because if that is going to happen, a lot of human element and uh, this thing uh, would go out of especially branches like psychiatry where empathy, uh, personal contact, rapport building, etc., becomes very important in mental health. Uh, uh, that, is, that is one of our worries. However, in, uh, I was just telling the organizers that uh, I'm the ideal candidate to choose because I'm a kidney transplant patient. I'm on immunosuppression. So for 15, 16 months, since March 24th last year, I've actually not moved out of home. I've not gone to my clinic. Uh, so I'm sitting at home seeing all my patients. And in fact, I've had a better response in terms of attendance from my patients because 70% uh, of my patients are out of Bombay patients. And instead of physically coming here and wasting time, money, and everything, they are finding it more easy to take earlier appointments, quicker follow-ups, uh, and do more interaction with me than they would in real time in my clinic. So I'm getting better evaluations of my patients online. Uh, in fact, I'm getting a lot more outstation patients referred to me now because the question of travel does not uh, stop patients. Uh, since uh, you know, they, they anyway have to contact a doctor online, so why not contact him online if he's in Bombay and he's somebody known to somebody who did. So that has improved in a way our interaction and our follow-up. And telepsychiatry, telemedicine has come to stay as Avinash said. Uh, it is a boon to not tier three, tier two, but to the more rural area right. where patients who are very, very far away from uh, even the nearest transports are able to access. Uh, for instance, my daughter was working in a very remote uh, part of Kaziranga boundary. With uh, she's a conservationist working with uh, freshwater turtles, and you know the hutment that she was staying in. Somebody had a fit, and my daughter luckily had a Wi-Fi connection to a dongle, and she actually sent me a video of the patient, and I told her what medicines. Uh, can be given and what precautions can be taken to see that the patient doesn't get hurt. And they actually did it and took the patient to the hospital and the doctors there were surprised at the prescription that had been sent. So that kind of thing is, is something that is really a boon for a country like India, where uh, there are still remote corners of a country where, uh, forget physician, uh, there is not even a modicum of, uh, you know, uh, uh, necessary you know, facility. So it, it, it is good for them if they are able to access our system. Right, so uh, thank you. So Adil. there are there are four questions. I'll just take right. them. Uh, yeah. One is, do you think the use of AI mental health apps will finally help in reducing the stigma associated with mental health? Because sadly, even in this age, there are many who still consider it something as either fictitious or something that immediately places the patient in an invalid category. This has been asked by Dr. Pratyusha Tadepali. Well, uh, Dr. Pratyusha, your question is very valid. Uh, I think what it will do at least is create awareness. And I think overall also mental health stigma is definitely reducing compared to 10 years ago. We are more, and I think what the pandemic has done is it has brought mental health into the limelight. So more and more people are, you know, seeking help. And because it's online, that fear that they had of going to a clinic is also not there. So I think it would definitely encourage more people to seek help. The stigma would only take more and more time to go. Uh, the same doctors asked a question that when robots are used for children, do you think it will reduce the child's interest in mingling with other children and be sorted to the robo itself? Well, I think a uh, robo is never used alone. We always tell the parent that social interactions with other children are also essential. What the robo serves is it serves as a training medium for social interaction in actual social situations. So you train with the robo and then place the child in actual social, social situations so that the child can mimic what was taught with the robo there. So that's how it works. Uh, Borun Rana has asked, what is the role of the Bitcoin in the modern healthcare system? I don't think I am 
qualified enough or equipped to answer that uh, foreign people are wasting money regularly is it possible digitalized skin instead of the wristband well that may happen i really don't know it could happen a small chip under your skin in the long run but i again i'm not qualified to answer that uh, yeah in your palm yes or around your palm yes that could happen okay. you touch your fingers to put it on or not yeah 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 that could happen uh, dr darpan shah wants to know do mental health tracking apps have mechanism similar to clinical rating scales well a lot of mental health tracking apps use rating scales and their scores are based on systematized and uh, i would say uh, clear rating scales which have been available so that's definitely there so their tracking mechanisms are uh, help you know you to get scores on rating scales so it's very much similar i totally agree with what you said right yeah is that it yeah right yeah i mean artificial intelligence is something that you have to understand what you mean by artificial intelligence um right. i i would rather instead of calling it artificial intelligence i prefer to use predictive intelligence you know it is it is it is mechanical learning it is it is it is uh, you know computer uh, data analysis which is predictive and analytically uh, effective in you know reading behaviors and predicting behaviors and predicting outcomes and that is what i believe is artificial intelligence so uh, i think yes yes it has got a big role to play yes uh, if used properly i mean of course the rider everywhere is appropriate rational validated use of all these digital objects or phenomena is important that they should be rated i mean just look i don't know if you have Uh, I'll probably send it to Avinash, and somebody can send it off. There is a video which has just come into play into my club of auto. You know, I'm a part of a specialized automobile club, and there's a video which has come of uh, how within three minutes, three vehicles totally burnt up at a electric charging station, and how noxious the fumes were. Uh, so you know, even newer technology has its own pitfalls, and we need to be careful about. what we are using and how we are embracing it and you know before it becomes fully developed and uh, we get all the bugs out we don't blindly follow and develop depend on that. yeah so thank you very much thank you avinash yeah. yes sir we are in you know very very uh, concise speech uh, thanks to the organizers would you like to take over mid five yeah somya I guess sir uh, one moment i'm just trying to switch on the camera okay uh I'm not able to see uh thank you dr avinash and dr anikan mittal for joining us today for the webinar on mental health and digital practice we have learned so many things i'm pretty much excited in knowing more about how robotics playing an important role you know in psychiatry and everything because for me uh what we have learned about robotics is uh, robotics helps people's work you know it simplify the uh, people's work but uh, we'll be liking to know liking to know more about how robotics plays a key role and uh, thank you anukan sir yeah and thank you iipp for uh, giving us an opportunity to collaborate for a wonderful session and we will be looking forward for more collaborations and more informative sessions in coming months and thank you attendees for joining us today thank you thank you yeah thank you thank you very much